I was, uh, this is video number 14, pardon me. As we talked on video 13 about the, the purest families of dogs and how these different families was bred here in America, this is where we left off, talking of the, the purest family. And I want to continue this video here talking about breeding and of this purest family and then I'm going to show how some of the other pictures of some of the other families that was bred off of this family, that was crossed off of this family, but kept in the way of a family by being bred back to this pure family after the cross was made, in a way of making another family and then you breeding it more pure and more pure. But this is basically the purest family of American bred dogs that have been bred over the years the game dogs has been here in America. This is the family that was the product that the American breeders produced over their years of proving their breeding, improving the breed. As I told y'all on some of the other videos, breeding is something that you learn more or less after a person has been through the core of the game and the breed in such a way as breeding is one of the last things that a person really learns in the game and it, it's as if throughout the game from the first beginning years one gets into the game dogs they get on a continued line in a way of going more towards the pure families and more towards the pure families. And after they've been in the game for many years, they learn more about breeding. And breeding is more or less the, the last thing that one learns in the game. Now, in time, I'm going to, when I get to, to be able to have the right kind of equipment that uh, puts these pictures in, and shows them at, at the right distance and everything where it really brings everything up real clear. I'm going to put it out some videos that shows this family, this very pure family of American bred dogs in the way of a lineage. Uh, I've got pictures that date back into the 1800s that we'll start with and we'll come all the way up to the present day in this lineage of the purest family. Now these dogs here that uh, I'm going to show you now, we're going to jump from Earl Tudor's time of the 1965-1970 and then the 1970s we'll say, on up to the present day time. These dogs that I'm fixing to show you now, they are that purest family of American bred dogs. Like I say, there's around 30 of them today in the United States and uh, uh, throughout the world and they're all bred pure of this family. Now there's a number of these pure ones that they're not breeding them back to the pure family. They're breeding them to other families. In other words, all the people that's got these dogs, they don't have a male and a female of this purest family. They've only got a male out of it or a female out of it. But there are two or three breeders that I put these dogs into their yards so that they could continue this pure family. And they are breeding the pure males back to the pure bitches and keeping this family pure. Now, there's, there's been talk about how a very close pure family of dogs will produce freak type dogs and weaknesses in dogs. Well, this is not true at all. This is some of the things that those people, the dog peddlers will say. This is some of the things the dog peddlers try to tell other people when they're peddling their dogs because they don't have real pure family bred dogs. So this, that's one of the stories they tell about the weaknesses. But this family of dogs here, these pictures that I'm fixing to show you, these are dogs that were, are, was bred in the 80s that are alive today. And these dogs, I, I haven't had any weaknesses in this family of dogs since I've had it. I don't have any kind of squirrely type dogs. These dogs are awfully strong, powerful built dogs with no weaknesses at all. 
they they're, they're very strong dogs sometimes i have small litters where then i don't have over a pair in some of the litters some of the litters are fours most of the numbers most all litters are even numbers and in most all litters there's a set of twins of the male and the female and there'd be a twin such as there'd be a six in a litter there'd be three sets of twins and then as I breed different kin of this pure family, mixing the genes a little different, I create a little difference in each litter. It's, a, it's, it's quite interesting as you really pay attention to this. And like I say, we're on the subject of breeding, which is very deep. And it, it's got an awful lot to it in this game, breeding has. So as, uh, as you hear these stories that I'm telling you, if you can get some blank pedigrees, and take those blank pedigrees and fill them out, fill these dogs' pedigrees out, then you'll be able to understand breeding in such a way as uh, you'll really benefit from it. Being able to understand breeding is something that will teach you the understanding of the way man has been bred over his period of time. And as you learn the breeding of a breed of dogs, such as learning the very purest family and how the other families are of that same breed are outcrossed from that purest family, it will give you an understanding of breeding that you can reverse in such a way as understanding how the, the United States of America has been bred as to our family's heritage. And you'll be able to understand how other nations also have been bred in such a way as being able to understand yourself and understand your heritage and understand how you're bred. It's, it's just like learning and understanding how these dogs are bred. Now, we've got record here where that we can run these dogs that I'm fixing to show you, these pictures of these dogs. I'm, we've got records of heritage that we can show on records that goes back for hundreds of years, a couple, few hundred years, a couple of hundred years or more. Now, to be a, that's a many generations. I don't know exactly how many generations that is on a dog's pedigree, but it's a lot. But the dogs, age is like seven to one to the man and to be able to find out your own heritage for just 200 years back you'll see that you won't have but so many generations nothing like the numbers of generations that will be on these dogs but you will in other words the, the people of the united states today if you can run your heritage back six or more generations, you'll be able to understand breeding, just, it'll just enlighten you so much. But we're talking about something that very few people have the knowledge of. They can show you how their dogs are bred and how they run back so many generations, but they themselves don't have the understanding to be able to show their heritage in a way of knowing how they're bred. This is something that's really becoming more interesting to the people in today's time such as some churches, libraries, and everything, they're really collecting this data, this material. In other words, where that you can find out a lot more than you might think you can find out. Just by going to the library and starting in on it, and uh, they'll direct you in the right way. And they've got companies and everything that even run things back to the part of where that it'll, uh, it's becoming easier and easier for someone to find out this information. But I'm going to show you these pictures now and uh, tell you about these dogs, a little bit about them. And uh, like I say, there's, there's around 30 of this purest family now. And uh, the understanding of them, I've been teaching the understanding of this family and how to breed it. This is something Earl Tudor never did. But uh, I, I see it in such a way as It'll, it'll save someone a lot of time and trouble. In other words, in the direction that they're trying to go with these game dogs. 
and it's going to be a way that they'll be able to be carried on in, into the other generations. And uh, I think I've uh, got it, the understanding of it, to be able to explain it. So uh, I'm going to show you some of these pictures, and then we're going to see some of the other pictures of some of the more families that's outcrossed from this family. This dog in this first row is the dog that I have that I call Dibo. It's the last dog that I have on my place. It's, uh, as you see, I'm not into doing much breeding now, although I do breed a few females to this dog. But uh, I don't own the females. I bred this dog out of brother and sister. Uh, his sire's name was a dog called Texas. And his dame was a female called Devi. They were brother and sister. All these pictures are of Dabo. This is his sister Locke. These are the dogs of the purest family that I bred. All these are Locke. This is Dabo's sister. She's in Holland. This is another picture of Moon. Now this is another picture of another dog called Moon that's out of that same breeding but a younger litter. This dog's in Holland. Sired by Braskin and his dames, a female called Chiba. This is Moon also that's in Holland. Powerful dogs. 
this is Pete again. These dogs are basically chocolate, fawn, and black of this family. The different generations, they'll run different colors. Now these are the some of the purest dogs that I've bred in the 80s after my years of um, my years of breeding the dogs and been in the game since the late 1950s. Like I say, this this family only has around 30 of them now, but their numbers are growing pretty fast as to what they've grown in the last number of years here on my yard. On the count, I do have a number of these dogs that I've dealed out over the 80s. And there's several yards where I put a male and a female so that the pure family could be carried on. And we were talking on video number 13 of the, the family of dogs the, that was outcrossed off of the purest family of dogs from Earl Tudor's yard. We were speaking of the, the, the Louie dog, and Miss Spike, and Zeke, and Butcher Boy, and Mike, Hondo, General, Bolio, Miss Spike, and a number of those dogs of this family. I'm going to show you some pictures of this dog, the dogs of this family. There'll be a few pictures, but I'm going to show you this, this family. And over the years, I kept this family breeding it more to the pure dogs of the family it was bred from. And it became a family of itself, but became more pure and more pure. Now, when Zeke left this area, we call this family in this area where we bred this family. We call this family Fitzwater's Old Goldie family. We called it the Goldie family. Now, as different dogs from this family left this area, other breeders started calling them the, the family of dogs by different names, such as some call them the Zeke dogs, Zeke bred dogs. Others call them Bolio's bred dogs. And different, they formed different names of families as to the way the different people bred them. Uh, the dogs of uh, Zeke, as it went out, more or less became more outcross bred. But uh, the different ones, Louie also, and uh, a number of the different ones. But I always kept this family, and I bred it back into the more of the pure family. Like I was telling you about the, the chopper dog. How I bred uh, the, the chopper dog to General Sister Spring produced a dog called Puddles. Well, Puddles was bred more or less like the dog called Hondo. It's, it's where I crossed the Lightning family, which was heavy three-quarter Tudor family, with this Goldie family. And then I continued to breed it back more pure. And I came more into my families than Frank Fitchwater's family. Now, I had a female here one of the last females that Frank Fitzwater bred. A, female, a black female I called Frankie. She was bred more of the purest breeding from Fitzwater's old Goldie dog that we had bred in this area. Frank had gotten a, a female from Bob Hemphill, which was this very strong Leitner family bred female, and bred it to his old Goldie dog. And he kept that Leitner stuff very pure. And this female that I ended up with, I was breeding her back to the pure family from Tudor. The pictures that I just showed you, those dogs. But that was one of the last families that I got rid of as I held on to nothing but the pure families. But I want to show you these pictures and call these dogs out to you of this, this family here that we talked of on video number 12 and 13. And there's lots of very famous dogs in this family. Lots of well-known dogs that's in this family. And like I say, it numbers 
the numbers in this family number quite a few in today's time i just really wouldn't know what number to guess at them but the numbers are of what you could call this family they number pretty good now but they're still one of the smaller numbers of families they are in the game there's a few more families that is more pure than this family and they number less in numbers such as the old lightning family that that family numbers fewer in numbers that was the next to the last family that i got rid of it was a family that was bred i bred it up to the part of purity that was very close pure to the purest family in other words, I have bred that throughout my years, and I brought that family back very pure. It was the second family, second purest family I had as I ended up my years. This is a picture of Zeke. This is when I had him matched in Mississippi with a little canard and his bulldog. That's my wife, Phyllis, that's holding him. He's a very good head fighting dog, very good dog. This is more or less one of the the first dogs bred off of this cross that we created, the, the old Goldie family that we call the Goldie family. This is Stockton's Liz. It's me holding her there in the pit right before a match that we had with a man named Jennings out of Mississippi. This was down in Pickens, Mississippi. was Liz. This was the sister to Maurice Carver's Miss Spike. Now you can see these dogs the way they're colored and all. You can see the cross that they're up close to before they get in a lineage of becoming more pure and more alike. Liz was the mother of Norman Hooten's Butcher Boy and Mike Weaver's Mike. When she was bred to Marshall's Joe. This is Louie. When Will de Stockton and I had him matched in Oklahoma. And he's just fixing to go on a scratch. The match was over two hours and 20 something scratches. This is Weldon Stockton on the right, myself on the left holding Louie after we come out of the pit. That was somewhere around 1970. Louie was bred off of, his uh, Dane was Womack's Mert, bred to a dog called Jug, which was Liz's brother. This is Norman Hooten and his Butcher Boy dog, which was out of Liz and Marshall's Joe. All these dogs are of this same family. This is Butcher Boy's brother, a dog called Mike, Ed Weaver's Mike. He won several matches with him. Very hard biting dog. This is Hondo. This is the, the breeding that I made where I brought it back to the Lightning family. Brought that family back to the Lightning family. His, his dame was a female that was a sister to Danny Burton's Tiger Dan, which was General Sire. His dame was Tiger Dan's sister, which was out of Tudor's Nigger and Womack's Merck. This is the dog Tiger Dan, Danny Burton's Tiger Dan. This is the dog that I bred when I took Womack's Merck to Earl Tudor's yard and bred to Tudor's nigger. This is one of the dogs that I give Earl for stud feed. He was a very good dog, very deep, dead game dog, had lots of ability. It's one of Earl Tudor's harnesses that's on there. I think that belonged to his demon dog. I'm not sure. 
But it was one of his very old harnesses that he gave Danny Burton. This is Tiger down here also. Tiger Dan was, uh, he was of that family, of the Goldie family, where that I had taken Mert, which was one of the first crosses, as we out of Goldie, Zeke's sister, and took her and bred her to Tudor's nigger, and that produced Tiger Dan and Hondo's mother and that litter. And as uh, that, that made that family become more pure, more pure. Now, as Danny Burton had the spooky female, which was spooky was the one that Earl Tudor gave Danny and his wife Bernice. And she was of Earl's purest family. She was of the purest family from Nigger and his sister Snip. This is spooky. And uh, she was owned by Danny Burton. This is her when she was just a puppy. This is a girl's purest family. That's her with that harness on that belonged to Demon. When she's getting a little more age on her. She was really a nice female, a very, very nice female, well made, well put together female. She was never schooled to match. She would just fight crazy from a puppy to a young age, but Danny never did school her, and I never did school her when I had her. Now, Danny took and got Tiger Dan from Earl, and he was the stud peep, uh, Tiger Dan, on that mating. And then when he bred, her back, bred him back to Spooky, the offsprings were even a more, on a more pure level of that family. It became the purest level of that family such as Butcher Boy, Weaver's Mike, Stockton's Louie, Carver's Miss Spike, Zeke, uh, uh, all of those dogs of that family. The mating that when Danny Burton bred the Tiger Dan back to Spooky, it brought the family even more pure. From that mating produced General. This is General when he was here on my yard. I've got other pictures of him that I'm going to show when I really tell about his matches. And uh, it'll be on a different video. I'm going to wait until I get that, the machinery that really shows the pictures well. I've got a lot of match pictures of him, pictures when he was here on my yard. He was a leggy dog with a real strong body, sharp muzzle, deep jaws. Very animalistic dog, very animalistic. This was the purest bred dog of that family, of what we call the Goldie family. This is General when he was a puppy on Danny Burton's yard. This was when he was a young puppy. This was a picture of his match, the first match that I matched him in. Going against one of Frank Fitzwater's dogs of the more Leitner family, of some of the purists that he had bred of the Leitner family, which was a very good dog, an outstanding dog. This match was really an outstanding match. General crushed both of his front legs and broke his stifle in half. When I say crushed his front legs, he went from the foot all the way up to the shoulder and absolutely crushed him with each bite. He was going against the dog called Duke. Duke was a very good head fighting dog, one of the strongest of that family. And he was in real good condition. Boy up here, the name of Billy Perdue conditioned him. I was going against Frank Fitzwater and Billy Perdue in this match. This is me and my wife and the trophy that we won with that match, the trophy for best dog of the show. This was in the early 70s. This was after I had bought General and it schooled him out. And this was his first match. This is Earl Tudor and Black Jack Jr. 
This was the last great outstanding dog that the game had seen. This was the most outstanding dog that had been bred here in America from this purest family. This was back in the 1920s. The next great dog to come along of this family was like 50 years later when General showed up. But this is his heritage. And he was the last great outstanding dog that was in the American game dog. This picture showed in Police Gazette newspaper and magazine in the 1920s. The dog had won seven matches, killed most of his opponents. Earl said he was a terribly hard biting dog, as was General. That's a 50 year span that two great dogs has been produced that no other dogs was their equal. This is a picture of Blackjack Jr. on Earl Tudor's yard with the man that owned him. Earl sold this dog to a man named Peterson. He was a gambler that lived in Hollis, Oklahoma. But Earl conditioned and handled the dog in all his matches. This is Blackjack Jr. also. This is Blackjack Jr. and Peterson, the man that owned him. I want to go on a little further with the, the subject of breeding while we're on this subject in this video. Uh, you know, like, like I was talking, this is one of the the number one interest in the game is, in a way, this is where the game, this is the area that the game leads you as you're in the game more years. And you'll hear many different stories about breeding throughout the game in your beginning years especially. And you, these different stories are created from the dog peddlers in the game. That's generally the people that they, they breed dogs to sell. And they buy dogs and breed dogs to sell. And they really don't have an understanding from the core of the game of breeding. And they turn and twist the stories about breeding to fit their yard of dogs. And then you have to go through a process of learning about all of that and being able to prove those stories is what's truth and what's not truth about breeding. But like I was telling you, this, this is a very deep subject. And it's, it's very interesting as you learn more of it. And the way that you can really learn this by taking this video like we've talked in the last three videos about breeding. And get you some blank pedigree papers. And put these dogs down of these different families that I'm talking about. These two families that I'm talking about. The very curious family and this uh, family that uh, has been bred off of them. Uh, the one that we've been talking about, Miss Spike, uh, Bo Leo, Zeke, Louie, and those butcher boy, the dogs of that family, general and whatever. But you should have the understanding of being able to fill out pedigrees at this time. In other words, it's very easy to research these dogs. All these dogs are well-known dogs other than the, the ones that are alive today in time, they're not all that well known. But their breeding is that well known. Of those purest families, they, those are all through the records of the game to the part of where even the youngest of a beginner today can fill out a pedigree blank on those purest dogs that I showed you there. From the different uh, pedigrees that they've seen through the game, these dogs' pedigrees are throughout the game, and their as their sires and their dames and their grandsires and granddames, they're all throughout the game. Very easy to research and fill out these pedigrees. The amount of understanding that you will learn by being able to like see this video and hear these stories I'm telling you, and make out a pedigree and look at this pedigree and see how these dogs have been bred and see the way the different families of the American game dogs have been bred like this 
from the purest family of the American breeders understand. Now, this is going to take you into a different level of understanding. This is going to uh, show you, such as, like, let me explain to you about how the different families get bred. Such as this Butcher Boy family, this Zeke family, this Goldie family is what we call it here in this area where it was bred in its last uh, era of time as the families was crossed between Leitner and Tudor with some Kobe on. And uh, more or less of the more pure bred families of American dogs was bred and came up to this town. Well, it was like Maurice Carver. He had a number of dogs of this particular family, the Outcross family that's outcrossed off of Tudor's purest family. But over his years, Maurice didn't breed those families of dogs that he had, those more pure families. It wasn't the purest family. He didn't go on to that purest family. He wasn't able to create the purest family on his yard. And he took his families of dogs that was bred very close to Earl Tudor's yard, and he crossed them together. Then later, he, he got some of the Eli family of dogs in there, which was not a true bred family of dogs, which Eli's mother was of unknown breeding that uh, it came by way of the blind Billy dog that its owner, Floyd Boudreaux, he never knew the breeding of the dog. That's some unknown breeding there, so that's a very outcross. And as Maurice crossed those different families together, he went the other way. He created that family becoming more outcrossed and more outcrossed, like we was talking in video 13. It became more outcrossed and more outcrossed as he dealed it off of his yard. Then those different families of Carver dogs was crossed together and they still became more outcrossed. To the part of now, here in 1991, those dogs that he started dealing in the 70s of this family, such as Miss Spike, the way that he bred those dogs, and then when they was bred back to one another in different areas, mostly in the south of the United States, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, on through that area, the Carolinas, and uh, that's where the largest part of the dogs Marty's deal into the United States went, and that's where a lot of the breeding of what they call Carver dogs and uh, was bred and are still being bred. Well, at this time, to explain to you how the percentage runs in numbers, and we're talking about the different numbers that's within a family of dogs. What you could call, what we will call the Carver bred dogs of today, they are the dogs of the most outcrossed breeding within a family. Their genetics show that they have more crosses of different families all throughout their heritage. Now they are the largest number in a family. They are the largest number of the breed that's within the American game dogs, such as those most outcross scatterbred dogs. They are the ones that number the largest in number. But as you go back to the more pure families that those dogs was bred from, those dogs and those more pure families, they're in less number as they get more pure. And you'll be able to understand this real good when, you, when you're able to fill out a pedigree, like a sixth generation pedigree. This is going to take you, such as this, this, this very pure family here, you fill out a sixth generation pedigree on that, it's, the, it's going to start in the 90s here, and it's going to take you all the way back into Earl Tudor's yard. It's going to take you back through his yard. That's, that's how far a sixth generation pedigree on the pure family take you. But if you fill out a sixth generation pedigree on what was called the Carver dogs, the Carver families, it won't even take you back to Carver's yard. In other words, this will show you something. It leads back to what we was talking in video 12 with Weldon and I, and he was asking me the questions about George Sadler, Joe Cabina, Earl Tudor, Leo Kennard, and the different players of the game in that era. 
and as to their ability of breeding and as to their ability in the game. Well, you're going to check in the pedigrees of today's dogs and you'll see how in every family you'll see Earl Tudor's name throughout history. Where that you'll see those other men's names very little. So that's going to show you and teach you something about where the level of understanding of breeding was. Now, it's not to say that they didn't breed lots of dogs, because they did. They bred lots of dogs, and I would say even more so that those men bred more dogs, more litters of dogs, than Earl Tudor bred. But you see, they didn't carry on in breeding them in a family way of breeding that became the American game dogs' purest families. They didn't breed that way. And those dogs, they drop out of sight in the history of the breed. The same way with uh, even though Maurice Carver's name will appear in the American breed, the American families of game dogs, many, many times, today's time. Within a period of time, there won't be any Carver dogs. There won't be any Carver families, and there won't be any Carver bred dogs that will be in the lineage of the American breed. As they become more outcrossed, they just fade out of history. They just fade out of the records. And only the more pure families, they're the ones that leave the records and leave the lineage of history. Such a way as they continue on. Now, the, the purest family that's bred today it has been bred in a way of lineage, like I talked of on the last couple of videos, in the way of where it was take off of the last curious family. And then it goes for so many generations that are being bred in different areas, becoming more pure and more pure. Now, uh, as you understand these, these different families, how they, they're, they're bred off of that purest family. And you see the way that they become different from one another as they're more outcross bred. They become more different and more different. And every time you put more cross in there some way or another, it creates the differentness in it. Until they, that type of breeding becomes very different from one another. And then when those dogs are taken and someone gets them for a number of years and starts breeding them more pure into their close kin, that's when you get a lot of freakiness. Three-legged dogs, you know, when you go to breeding those outcross bred dogs in a way of family breeding that's real close, that's where all that freakiness comes from, screw tails and things like that. And, but it doesn't come in the pure families. The more purebred families, that family will be real strong, powerful, more body, more, more strength, the whole thing as to what we're breeding for. Now the direction that we breed for in the breed, the American game dog, it's as if what we have proven over the years of American breeding is that we have bred them into a lineage, into a pureness family that heads in the direction of a family of dogs or animals that has been bred in the wild by nature. In other words, such as an a family of wolves, a family of coyotes, a family of leopards, a family of lines, they breed themselves into a family of very pure lookalikes, very pure ability, 
very much the same within that breed. All of them more or less identical. The males identical, the females identical. Well, this is the direction that the, we have bred the dogs, our game dogs. This is the direction we have bred the different families and the purest family. We're, we're trying to create a breed of dogs bred by man that's stronger than nature would have bred them. We're trying to outdo nature in breeding, in a sense. Like in nature, only the strong survive. Well, it's the same way in our breed of dogs. The very strongest is what we have used over the period of time to create this breed, this family that is bred near just like the families of animals are bred in nature. But this is came from man's understanding. Now, don't go to thinking that we created this here in America, that we the Americans have created this American game dog and this breed, and this family. This is a family of dogs. This is a breed of dogs. This is a family of dogs, of the purest family of dogs that has been bred by man. In other words, throughout the history and the heritage of this game family, in all its time of history, it has been the purest bred breed of any dogs or any animals that man has had control of their breeding. This is the purest of it all that man has created. In other words, this lineage of this pure family that's like nature, this lineage has been bred throughout his time alongside man in man's heritage. It's like I, I was telling you in some of the other videos. This family and this breed can be traced back into the, the heritage of man very deep as to the, the records that's been left behind and then you go into the artwork, into the poetry, into the different word of man that's left behind and the different artwork and the different uh, whatever, but you'll see this family of dogs all the way back through the heritage of man, man's left record. It's like you can see some of these dogs in the days of the Roman and the Greeks, in that age, in BC time. You can see this same breed of dogs in their artwork to a point where they that same dogs that you'll see in their artwork will be just like this same purest family that we have here today. In other words, they'll have them bred so pure at that time that it's just like this same breed. In other words, same size, same body makeup, same look, everything. It's just almost identical to this breed as to there's no other breed of dogs bred in the world that resemble those dogs but our breed that we have here today is bred of the purest family of American game dog. Now if you want to go a little deeper and get into breeding where that it becomes real interesting, like I was saying, you'll learn a knowledge of breeding by learning the knowledge of game dogs, the way these American dogs have been bred, to a part of where it can advance your understanding of the way man has been bred. And when you when you go to learning this, to putting this together, you'll see that the purest families of dogs known to man, they have been bred in the area where the heritage of man was the most outcross bred in their era of time. Such as when the, the gamest, purest families of the game dogs, of the American game dogs, in their heritage, when the families was called the English Bulldogs in England, those people in 
in that area of England who were the breeders of the English Bulldogs, purest families. Those people in that area were the most outcross-bred people in the world. It's the way their heritage will show. It's all on record. Very easy to understand. And then as the, the game families of Europe, game dog families, the pure families of game dogs from Europe, came to the United States of America. And they was bred together and started back on that pure line again, pure breeding way again. The American breeders at that time, they became the most outcross bred people in the world. There beside them was the purest bred breed, the purest bred family of dogs bred in the world. Now, as I said, this, these dogs came about in such a way as the breed and the game of breeding the game dogs all came to a point in the 1970s that all of it kind of reached a peak in that era of time. Our understanding of conditioning reached a peak in that time. Our understanding of breeding, our understanding of the breed and the, the family breeding that we had reached was producing such superior dogs, such strength, that they're, they're stronger than any breed of animal, a gamer than any breed of animal bred by nature. This is what man has created in this breed of dogs. As you understand the way the, the dogs have been bred, and they came through all this lineage of history and heritage and continue to be bred more pure, more pure, more pure, as they became more like nature, more like the, uh, the breeds that nature creates. You see that most all the other breeds of animals that man has taken over and take control of their breeding has went the other way. They've been more outcrossed. Now there's some breeds, such as the Greyhound, such as the thoroughbred racehorses, such as different, uh, a few different breeds, they're more family type breeds. But those breeds of animals, they haven't had records kept of their breeding near as long as the, the breed that we breed, the game families of dogs. Those are the oldest records known to man on any breed of animal. And we have got them bred closer to the way nature would breed a very pure family of lookalikes. Now, as the game hit the peak, in the 70s. I find it very interesting to, to tell you how the purest family became bred here in Texas, in this area of Texas. And it, it's even more interesting to note that the people of this area where this curious family has been bred over the last number of years, their records of heritage will show that those people of this area that has heritage in this area of three or four generations or more in this Texas area, they're the most outcross people, families of people in the United States. The United States being the most outcross bred people in the world. And it kind of brings you back to that part of understanding and knowing how those two th subjects, those two features has traveled along beside one another in such a way as the game dog, the purest family bred here in Texas, and the most outcrossed heritage bred here in Texas. But in the in the last so many years throughout the 80s, this family, this very purest family, has been gone, has been leaving Texas in the way of where that is now being bred across the United States 
and in different nations throughout the world. And they're getting their, the very curious family is going to diff, more yards and more yards throughout the world. And it's being bred not by just the most outcross bred people. I see it as a, an era of time that things are really changing within this breed. It can uh, get to where it'll sound a little weird the way I'm explaining this. But it's, this is truth that I'm telling you, that the records show our history of the breed, the records show this has been happening all along. I'm not talking about what's going to happen. I'm talking about what's already happened that's on record for you to understand in a way of being able to Research it out. Don't just listen to what I've got to say. Research it out and you'll gain the same understanding that I'm telling you about. And then you'll, you'll be like me. You'll say, well, I'll be, you know, I wonder how it happened, you know, and how it, create, it came about being this way. But this is just the way it came about being. The, the dogs of the, the inner core of this breed, they're the purest bred families. And as they go out into the largest numbers, they're the most outgrown. Now, this should give you an understanding of breeding in such a way as what we're after in this game. We're after the strongest, most powerful, animalistic breed of dogs known to man. But this will show you what you want. In other words, what, you're try what we're trying to do, we're trying to get back to that point of nature. But it will be something that man has taken control of and proved his understanding of nature in such a way as even the conditioning part of a dog. In other words, you're wanting to condition a dog that's going to be matched into one of its own. Same weight, same sex. A contest to prove which one is the strongest, which one is the most animalistic, which one is that one that is the closest to the way nature would breed them. Well, this is what we've proven over the history of the game. This is the direction we've taken. Now, to have a dogs like this, in other words, this doesn't mean that they're going to be on a wall the wildness of nature. This means this is a breed that man has control of. And the wildness of nature is not there as far as man not having control of it, like the wolf, the coyote, the different things like that. In other words, these purish bred families of dogs, they are by far the most superior breed of dog known to man. They are the dog. I mean, they are a dog's dog. In other words, the looks that they get from anyone that's ever owned a dog is that look that says, wow, what a dog. What a dog. And uh, this, is, this is what we're breeding. Such as, these dogs can be taken to the shows. It did, uh, such as some of the high society shows won't even let you enter one of these dogs, one of these very pure families. The people that bred the breed of game dogs, they had to start creating their own shows. The, now the Staffordshires, the more outcross dogs of this breed, they show them, and they by far led the shows in first place wins. The Staffordshire breeds did. Well, they're just an outcross breed that's been bred off of this breed that we have of very pure dogs. Now, I mean, you know, anyone with any sense would tell you that the more pure families is far the superior dog if it was to be judged by someone that had an understanding of a dog as the way they relate back to nature. 
I mean, you know, the judges would have to give these dogs, number one, I mean, you know, as to the way they've been bred over there. The history, where all your other breeds of dogs, when you go to learning the breeding subject, and you go to back into the Staffordshires, the English Bulldogs, the Mastiffs, the Terriers, all the other breeds of dogs. Some of those dogs are going to be bred closer to this purest family of mankind's dogs that he's bred towards nature. All the other breeds are going to be bred off of that family. Their heritage will go back to the family of purest bred dogs that man had bred in that era of time when those different breeds were created. And today in time we have probably well over 800 breeds. I would say closer to a thousand different breeds in today's time. Now many of those breeds was bred by the crossing of those different breeds and different breeds that had been bred off of the crossing of the Gamish breed. That's the way they'll show. Many of those different breeds won't have the history of their breed that can go back far enough to show you how they were created. Many of those breeds don't. Some of the breeds do. But as you learn breeding, of the game family of dogs, it will teach you the understanding of the breeding of all breeds of dogs. All breeds of dogs. Just as your understanding that you will learn from that will give you an understanding of the breeding of all of mankind, such as all nations of man, such as all man, not just one race of man, or one nation of man, but it'll teach you just like you, you'll learn about the breeding of all dogs, you'll learn about the breeding of all men. And all of this is documented and on record for anyone to be able to research and learn this. But I wanted to go on a little further with it and tell you about it in a at a time when it's it can tie in to what we're talking about on these videos that tie in to these families of dogs that all of you game dog people that you know see in these videos that y'all have understanding about you can start from this point in a way of being able to show all this on paper on pedigree and on record so that you can understand it and i believe it'll uh, you know it'll you know, help you out in ways of learning lots of things when you learn about breeding. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very deep subject. And uh, how some old country hick like myself got off into it with a seventh grade education was through these game dogs. In other words, I can sit down and talk to a person with the understanding of genetics and breeding and of mankind and we can get into discussions and I can go to explaining my understanding that I've learned from what I've learned of breeding the American game dogs. Their mouth drops, they, they become amazed at the things that I'm telling them and I'm able to explain it in such a way as anyone can understand it. And this is what I've learned from spending so many hours, so many days and years with an interest of game dogs and the subject of breeding. Now I know this is nothing new to y'all, the ones of you that are in this breed of dogs, such as, I think I've said before, there's been many divorces came from these game dogs, people that has an interest in the game dog. Men will quit going to the bear joint and they'll quit running the streets and they'll quit doing lots of things when they get the interest of game dogs on their mind. 
and get into the game. They'll spend hours upon hours upon hours of looking at dog magazines. All the history they can buy, they can afford to buy and get together. They'll spend time reading. Spend a large percent of their time and just writing down pedigrees and studying breeding. And this is this is what can this is where it can take you. In other words, you just advance along and advance along as you study this. And it'll give you a good understanding of life. In other words, it's not time wasted on just the dogs. It'll give you a good understanding of life as you go on in life. You learn more and more about these dogs in such a way as it'll feed back and it'll give you the understanding of people, the understanding of yourself, and the breeding of how we've all been bred. This is a, a game that's, uh, at this time, you know, it's, it's pretty well looked down upon by the Society of Law that doesn't have any understanding of the breed. They uh, are pretty well looked down upon, but still yet, there's over 20 million dogs of this breed at this time. That's more dogs of one breed than any breed of dogs known to man. Where in the 1970s and before, this breed had the smallest number of dogs within the breed of any breed of dogs known to man. It had the smallest number. But in today's time, after those 70s and 80s, with the Humane Society promoting the breed and the lawmakers putting in laws about them, and many news stories being made on TV and magazines and newspapers about the breed. It has populated the breed up to over 20 million in today's time. Now, think about it in such a way as most everybody that ever owns one of these breeds of game dogs, they create a percent of that interest that makes them want to get a little closer with knowledge to learn a little more about that dog because that dog takes so much of their interest. Today in time, you can see some of these game families, some of these families that's bred closer to the pure families, they're in the hands of a number of famous people in today's time. And as you remember that picture that I showed you at the beginning of this video, it, it has some very famous people that are well known today's time. That was at Pittside to witness the fact. Well, these people in today's time, they have no interest in fighting a dog. They have no interest in matching the dog. But they have a whole lot of interest in learning about the heritage of their dogs. They want to know about their matches. They want to know all about the heritage of that breed of dog that they've got now. A number of the sporting people, a number of the pro professional sport people, football, basketball, boxers, a lot of movie stars. Michael Jackson has one. A number of well-known people throughout our society today has some of the more purebred families. In other words, they don't have those purest bred families. But theirs, is, theirs aren't those real scatterbred outcross bred ones that's bred on the forest level of outcrossing. They're bred up a little higher towards the pure families. I was told Sugar Ray Leonard has some. I say some. I don't recall if they said he had one or two. Tommy Hearns, prize fighter, the prize fighter, he has a few. We have some the Dallas Cowboy football players here in Dallas who has some. Uh, there's a, there were some of the professional football players in Los Angeles that had some of the dogs. Now, most of those people, like I say, they don't have an interest to match their dogs. But they definitely got an interest to, they would love to see some of the matches. But they wouldn't go to a match where they would be breaking the law to see any of them. In other words, they would love to see movies of them, pictures of them, or whatever. In other words, because they, 
they have that interest. But in today's time, you know, it's so close to be a lawbreaker in this game. Even to the part of where they wrote laws out here in Texas. Where they could come in and arrest me if I had my cat mill up here. And had my dogs, this family of dogs, and a cat mill, or a treadmill, or a table, or machinery to condition a dog on, they could come in and arrest me. This is the way the laws was wrote, that the way they put the laws in. They call them intent, intent laws. I mean, you know, an intent law is, uh, you might as well just say it's communism. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's say, uh, that's just like uh, predicting what you're going to do. Uh, saying that you have that with intent to fight them. Well, that's, that's uh, nonsense. I mean, you know, a person could, uh, I haven't fought a dog in uh, over 12 years. All right, I could have a cat meal or a treadmill or a table or whatever just for exercising purposes to show these dogs with. To use these dogs as weight pulling or whatever. But they make such laws that goes against anyone that has this breed in such a way that they can really make it hard on you. Can really make it hard on you. They're very foolish laws, but laws are made in a way that there's always someone that's going to benefit from those laws in the way of making money out of them. And if you go to researching the Humane Society, you'll see that the Humane Society gets millions and millions and millions of dollars a year grants from the government and from each state where that they created these laws over this breed and put these laws into the different states in the United States. And they're doing the same thing throughout the world. They're doing the same thing in Europe. They're just following this breed in a way where that they're promoting it into large numbers from man's interest in that type of a dog. Man has always had a big interest for dogs. Certain percent of society is dog people that has an interest in dogs. And this breed of dogs has created so much interest that he's making the population just grow within the breed. And human society is publicizing and making big news stories out of it so that it'll get lots of stories about the breed. And the people recognize the breed of saying, wow, what a dog. That's just the kind I always wanted. And they go and get the dog, in a sense. I mean, they get into that breed. And then they get a little deeper and a little deeper. Within the Humane Society is right behind the populating of the dogs and putting in new laws. They tell people to make watchdogs out of these dogs. They make great watchdogs and people turn them into a watchdog. And these dogs are bred so game, they're not going to run out there and bite a burglar on the, the leg or bite someone on the leg and let go and run. They're going to go for their throat and try to kill them in a sense that that's the amount of strength and gameness that they've been bred for throughout time. But it's people's lack of understanding, such as the Humane Society, that tells the society to take this breed of dogs and they make great watchdogs. They make great pets and great watchdogs. They do make great pets. They do make great watchdogs. But they have so much strength and so much gameness that the other breeds don't have. Where the other breeds, like a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd, or whatever, any of those other breeds, you can kick one of them right upside the head or in the rib cage when they come at you to bite you, and they'll squall and run off quick, especially someone that has an understanding of dogs. But you kick one of these game-bred dogs, you kick one of these dogs up the side of the head or in the chest or something, He's only going to go no further than how much foot you put to him, and then he's going to hit on his feet, and he's going to come right back at you. This is the kind of dog this is. This is the power of this kind of dog. And when you make watchdogs out of this type of dogs, you got to understand, you have got something there that's just like a machine gun loaded with a clip back, safety off. I mean, you know I myself, I don't think any 
anyone has any business to train these game grid dogs to be watchdogs in that the type as they train the German Shepherds, the Dobermans, and that type of a watchdog as those dogs are trained to bite people. They're not trained to be a watchdog. They're trained to bite people, to attack people. The only ones that they're not to attack is the ones that feed them and care for them. But they're trained to bite everybody else. Now you might be able to do that with dogs of lesser gameness. And you won't get into any trouble. But when you train these pure family bred dogs, the American game breed, when you train these dogs to be that type of a guard dog, bites people, it's a, you're fooling with something very dangerous that's very subject to kill a number of people. Cause lots of problems. It also creates lots of stories that the Humane Society gets and uses on TV and in newspapers to create the laws that they create. It fills their pockets full of gold. You understand what I'm saying? You can train these dogs in such a way as you really have an understanding of dogs as to the way to train dogs and a way of making a real nice dog for someone. You don't train them to bite people. You train them to accept all people. You train them to be a very friendly dog that when someone comes up in their yard, they don't meet them by trying to take their leg off. They don't meet them wagging their tail and being friendly to them. And if you train those dogs right, those same people that if they those same people that come around, if they want to try to come around when they're not supposed to be coming around, say they come around at night, those dogs would bark at them and meet them with a different way. They would more or less show the, the watchdog in them would start coming out at that time. If someone was to come to with ill feelings on their mind, we'll say, to create problems those dogs wouldn't meet them with the wagging of the tail and the real friendliness. They would meet them in a different way. Now, I had one dog trained that way. I called him King Tut. And he was a dog that uh, was friendly to everybody. Friendly to everybody. But no one could touch him. Anyone ever tried to touch him, he would let them know to never do it again. And they would never try again. But he wouldn't bite him. But he'd let them know when he got through with them, they would never try to touch that dog again. Although he'd be standing there wagging his tail and just a friendly. But uh, that dog was real close to me. And that dog would sit at my uh, feet. I'd let him run loose on the yard when there'd be people around sitting out on the tree and we'd be gathered around talking. That dog would sit at my feet and he would get between me and anyone. And if someone got up on their feet out of their chair would, and start making movement, that dog would stand up on his feet and he would just sort of watch, watch that person. And now if that person was to try to hit me in the head with a stick or something, I'm sure that dog would be on that person in a minute. But that dog wasn't trained to bite people in a way of attacking people. The, the people of today's time that have listened to the humane societies, they have got the dogs 
and trained them in the way they trained Dobermans and German Shepherds, in a way of making them aggressive to people. And uh, it's created lots of laws. It's created lots of stories that created lots of laws. There's been lots of people in the United States.